Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Bella Clementi, MAG's Advancement Events Manager. Thank you all so much for joining us for this special presentation to celebrate the opening of MAG's Renaissance Impressions Exhibition. Our guest today is Lauren Tagliaferro. She's one of MAG's curatorial assistants. Um, and thanks to your support through membership, we're able to have programs like this one for you online. Before we start our presentation, I just wanna review a couple of housekeeping items. We do have live captioning with us today. So if you would like to see captions, click the closed captioning button on the Zoom bar on your screen. We're also going to have time for questions at the end of our presentation today. So please submit your questions for Lauren using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Finally, when our webinar ends today, your browser should take you to a short survey about your experience so please fill that out and let us know what you thought about our presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce Lauren. She's been a curatorial assistant at the MAG since 2018. And before that, she was the collections planning specialist at RMSC and the registrar and assistant curator of the Sue Ann Jeanette costume collection at Syracuse University. She received her master's in art history and her master's in museum studies at Syracuse University and is the co-author of 500 Patterns, a comprehensive source book of over 500 patterns across six design styles in textiles and the decorative arts alongside Jeffrey Meyer and Todd Conover of Syracuse University. Lauren, I will now pass the mic to you. Thanks, Bella, I appreciate it. Um, thank you everybody for joining me in this webinar today online. Um, I hope that you have had a chance to go and see the exhibition. It's extremely beautiful. Many thanks to Nancy Norwood, our presenting curator. She did a beautiful job. And also to our um, exhibition team who's done an incredibly beautiful job with that exhibition. So if you don't get a chance to see it today, definitely see it soon. We open um, to, the, to the greater public uh, tomorrow. Um, but I wanted to uh, share my screen real quick and um, talk to you about this. So, um, to begin with, I have been interested in ugliness in art uh, ever since I really started my career in art history. I mean, um, don't get me wrong, the whole reason I wanted to be curator and, and study art in general was because it was ostensibly the study of human-made beautiful things. Um, there's this art philosophy of sorts, you may have heard of it, it's called Art pour l'art or art for art's sake, where art is made solely for the sake of making it and to provide pleasure for both the artist and the viewer. Um, the images you see here are just a couple of examples and a few details of some pieces that are in the Renaissance Impression show right now. So to talk about beauty in, and to kind of like get a general overview of like beauty and art, um, we're gonna hit some kind of like high level art history theory notes. So stay with me but it makes sense, I promise. So in his text, The Republic, Plato says that art imitates the objects and events of ordinary life. So art is a copy of a copy of perfection. And so it's even more of an illusion than ordinary experience. So works of art are at best entertainment and at worst, a dangerous delusion to Plato. So art is imitation, uh, which was known as mimesis or the representation of nature. So we can conclude that Plato didn't really take the notion of art being created by divine inspiration really seriously. Um, Aristotle, on the other hand, saw art form as a way of representing the inner significance of something or the essence. So to Aristotle, art offers unity and the form should be really complete in and of itself. So he sums this up in his theory of mimesis, um, which is the perfection and imitation of nature. So now, Art as imitation involves the use of mathematical ideas such as symmetry, proportion, and perspective in the search for this perfect, timeless, beautiful object. So hence the Greek concept of beauty was based on this pleasing balance and proportion of form. So the ancient Greeks were innovators in the field of art and developed many new styles and techniques to achieve that perfectness of balance and proportion. Uh, and that concept has influenced countless artists ever since. Um, it can be argued that art up to the Greeks had been kind of abstract and formal, while from the Greeks onwards, it was based upon realism. Now I am speaking specifically of the Western canon. 
Um, we're talking about Europe. We're talking about, you know, Egyptian. We're talking about like white European representations of art in this, in this context for this talk. So the ancient Greeks were obsessed with aesthetics. And this is from the Greek word aesthetikos, meaning of sense perception. And aesthetics is the study of beauty and the ancient Greeks held beauty above all. And to Plato, it was an ideal. So despite the differences in Plato's and Aristotle's views of art, um, they did in fact agree that art objects should try to be both beautiful and useful. So for Plato, beauty was summed up in an object's suitability and utility for purpose. And it is from these times that beauty is linked to function. So Aristotle wrote about the idea of four causes. So the first formal cause is like a blueprint for the idea for the artwork. The second cause is the material, what a thing is made out of. Um, the third cause is the process by which the artist makes the thing. And the fourth cause is the purpose of a thing known as telos. So Aristotle considered it important that there be a certain distance between the work of art on the one hand and life on the other. So functionality in these terms kind of leaves us with a dilemma. Um, can't an object be beautiful without being useful? So it's possible to see the problem since the skills of the artist, the craftsman, and the technologist all involve changes, right? A sculptor changes a block of marble into a statue, the artist changes pigments into a colored picture, and the craftsman uses tools and heat to change a block of metal into a tool. But really, only two of these examples would be described as art, and then the other one would be described as technology, right? So it appears by now, art and technology have con diverged completely. It could be rationalized that as artists aspiring to give permanence to the present by creating works that will endure for art all time, and technicians aiming to use skills to press on into the future to new discoveries which will change with time. So technology is about permanent change, improvement, and moving society onto a new age or progress. So the concept of realism and beauty could still be the most commonly held theory for art amongst the majority of people today, but is that too simplistic? The author John Ruskin wrote at the beginning of the uh, last turn of the century, he stated, art does not represent things falsely, but truly as they appear to mankind. Yet not long after, Pablo Picasso, when asked what he painted, uh, and if he painted what he saw, he replied, I paint what I know is there. So painting what one sees is a description of art as imitation, but Picasso was kind of flouting this issue of imitation, alluding to artistic creation as something entirely within the artist. So now the goal of the artist is self-expression, not necessarily imitation of any feature in nature. So inspiration and the subject matter can derive from within the mind of the artist, or they could be trying to kind of distill the essence of what is seen, creating an abstraction of its qualities. So that's just kind of like a brief overview of art and like this concept of beauty as it has been kind of interpreted, especially through the ancient philosophers. Now let's talk about ugliness, which you could simplistically describe as the opposite of beauty. Now this may or may not be true, but, but we'll get into that. I started really thinking about ugliness as a tool by artists when we at the Mag hung our George Kondo, which is seen here on the left, up into our 17th century gallery. And we actually um, paired him next to our Jan van Rijvenstein. This is a portrait of a man from 1632 on the right. Um, and that George Kondo is actually called the clown. It's from 2010. Um, people really hated it. We got a lot of letters and complaints and people were really kind of vitriolic about it. They had a very visceral reaction to the Kondo being up in our 17th century gallery. Um, but that's what I found the most fascinating because in, we're in the 21st century, right? We're inundated with the ugly, the weird, the repulsive all the time, right? From Twitter to Instagram to even just streaming shows. Technology is a, at this point is where we can see realistic depictions of the wildest, most disturbing things a creative mind can produce. And you'd think that we would become kind of desensitized to it or at least just overwhelmed with the amount of it. So my question was, why would a single painting hanging in something as, you know, quote unquote, old fashioned as a museum cause such a visceral reaction from our public? So that's what got me thinking about the power of art and the power of ugliness in general, and also what and how do we as human beings find certain things beautiful and perfect and others ugly and repellent. 
And truly few did ugliness and beauty like the artists of the Renaissance. So going off of this simplistic concept of ugliness as the opposite of beauty, Carl Rosenkrantz wrote a treatise in 1853 really solidifying this idea. So just as evil and sin are the opposites of good, whose hell they represent, so is ugliness the hell of beauty. So in a Western Judeo-Christian religious context, all that is good is described as beautiful and worthy of meditation. And Renaissance artists were really well aware of this convention, and we're certainly not going to rock the boat on the portrayal of good equals beautiful and evil equals bad. So we see this most vividly in the depiction of Christ in limbo. This is called uh, The Harrowing of Hell by Albrecht Durer. This is from 1510 here on the left. Um, this piece is part of a larger 12 piece collection of woodcuts by Durer called The Large Passion, which he published altogether as a book in 1511. Um, the subject of this image is an event described in a second century text appended to the apocryphal fifth century gospel of Nicodemus. So as the story goes, during the three days between his entombment and resurrection, Christ descended into hell where he broke down the doors that sealed the dead in order to bring the righteous who had died before his advent to paradise. So in this image, Christ has already released Adam who stands in a pose kind of reminiscent of Michelangelo's David. Um, Adam is here, as you can kind of see. Um, he is uh, standing in this kind of contrapposto pose of Michelangelo's David. And uh, Dora probably saw the David when he was in Italy on a trip um, in between 1505 and 06. Um, Eve stands in shadow behind Adam, and it might be their third son, Seth, who stands next to him with his hands raised in prayer. Around all of them are the infants slaughtered by King Herod in the Massacre of the Innocents, of which we have a couple of examples in the Renaissance Impressions show. Um, Adam, in his uh, right hand, holds the fateful fruit, and in his left, he holds the cross on which Christ was crucified, which, according to legend, was made of the tree that Seth planted on Adam's grave. So here, Christ dominates the center of the composition. He's radiating the holy light described by the Gospel of Nicodemus. He ignores the ugly, threatening demons around him as he crouches to bring John the Baptist, who's in the lower right corner, um, identified by his hair shirt through this archway of limbo. And as you can see, there's all of these, these demons all around. There's these wonderful kind of images of scary creatures um, and darkness, and they, they're kind of hybridized like creatures and animals and humans. Um, to me, they look like a little like Muppets, almost like figures you would see in the labyrinth or the dark crystal. And I really wouldn't be surprised if those creature designs were inspired by images such as, as this one. Um, but to a Renaissance viewer, uh, they would have seen these creatures as horrific, um, horrific abhorrent representations of what would await you in the afterlife if you didn't follow Christ. Um, on the other hand, everyone depicted on the left side of the composition are beautiful in the light of Christ, right? Aged Adam has this beautiful ripped body, as does, does his much younger son. The babies are chubby and they're cute. And obviously Christ himself, although we don't see his entire face, it's literally shining with glorious divine light and beauty. And also his body is equally as muscular and ripped, but we'll get to pretty Jesus on our next slide. So these distinctly Christian, so this distinctly Christian image really illustrates this kind of binary of moralizing ugliness. Um, but moralizing ugliness is not only seen in Christian contexts, this binary is also seen in secular representations of moral traits as well. So personification is the term we use in art history to describe the artistic convention of using human figures, usually women, to represent these abstract ideas or concepts. So we see this a lot in Greek and Roman art, but it was adopted by Judeo-Christian cultures as an easy shorthand for depicting these moralizing scenes. So on the right here, we see a non-Christian image. This is Jean Chartier's Allegory of Envy from 1557. Um, and this portrays the concept of envy as a filthy woman who chews the flesh of vipers, emaciated and grayish, according to Andrea Alciati in his book of emblems in 1531. Um, here, Envy, she is standing in the center, is gaunt, screaming, and handling snakes that twist around her arms and even bite her. Um, her hair is wild and knotted, and even smaller snakes emerge from her filthy head. Um, her breasts are kind of saggy and flat. She's overall just kind of this terrifying, hideous image of the abstract trait of Envy, implying 
that if one is to be envious or to feel envy, you are no better than the screeching snake wielding harpy. So in this context, which is suggested to be envy berating the personification of learning or possibly originality, um, that is this gentleman here who kind of like is startled by her. <laughs> He's kind of like, oh, like looking over his shoulder at this terrifying woman who rose up behind this column. Um, but it's, a, it's basically meant to be a warning to scholars that their learning and new ideas may rouse envy from others. So obviously, subtlety is not the way to go when artists are depicting moralizing narratives or images. Um, but things get a little harder to define in terms of this good equals beautiful and bad equals ugly when we start seeing images of Christ and specifically his suffering um, beginning in the Middle Ages and really taking off in the Renaissance and Baroque. So essentially, Jesus is most often described as beautiful, right? A lot of times to, almost, to an almost absurd degree. Um, the Bible in Isaiah describes Christ as being unremarkable in appearance, um, but soon after the pagan Greek philosopher Celsus ridiculed Christians for having a, quote, ugly God in around 180, all of a sudden depictions of Jesus started to become far prettier. And I think that's such a, I told my, I was telling my students about this, and I thought it's just so funny that, <laughs> that some guy who didn't even believe in God was like, you guys have an ugly God, and all the Christians were like, no, we don't. He's gorgeous. Whatever. You don't know anything. And so suddenly all the depictions of Christ are very, very beautiful. So for St. Augustine, Christ was, quote, beautiful as a child, beautiful on earth, beautiful in heaven. Europeans took this a lot farther uh, a little bit later and began to depict Christ as not only beautiful, but white beautiful. So the historical Jesus was Hebrew and most likely Middle Eastern in appearance, but many later images of Jesus depict him with these distinctly Euro looks. There's this great line in a Patty Griffin song called Making Pies where she sings, Jesus stares at me in my chair with his big blue eyes and his honey blonde hair. And, and this comes directly from a Greek and Roman tradition. Um, early Christians based the good shepherd Christ, as you can see in this um, sculpture on the far left, these were um, based on images of the god Apollo, while later Hellenistic depictions of bearded, muscular gods influenced the Christ Pantocrator or Christ as omniscient ruler of the universe, which soon became the standard depiction of Christ as a bearded, long-haired man in his 30s that we're familiar with today. Um, we also, uh, I also had to include an image of Ted Neely from Jesus Christ Superstar, who was so incredibly, <laughs> such an incredibly beautiful guy, and like what we think of as Christ now, right? And um, this is an image from a couple of years ago, I believe there were some scientists who did a study about, they did some um, studies from uh, remains of uh, humans, human bones and skulls and things from around the, the time of Christ and tried to make like an image of what Christ may have looked like during this time period. Um, so this is what they came up with. And then of course, here is like the classic honey blonde Christ. Um, so two pieces in our Renaissance Impressions exhibition really emphasized this beauty of Christ as it was viewed in the Renaissance. On the left, we see Il Perdono or forgiveness. Um, this is the vision of St. Francis by Federico Barocci from 1581. Um, and on the right, we have Christ and Mary Magdalene. This is also known as Noli Mi Tangere, which means um, touch me not. Um, and this is by Orazio de Santis from 1572. So both, as you can see, are Italian artists working under these conventions of beautiful white Christ. So in the Barocci piece on the left, Christ, who is at the top there, he's kind of standing on a bunch of baby heads. Um, he is beautiful and celestial. He has this kind of mannerist quality to his elegant hand gestures and the illusion of movement in his body and feet. He looks like he's stepping forward. There's also this beautiful form of shortening in his arms. Um, and in the St. Francis below, where it looks like he's kind of stepping out of the niche that he is in. Um, it's just like a really beautifully rendered image. Um, but Christ's face is, is radiant and soft. He has this gentle expression of compassion on his face. And of course, there's this beautiful light that surrounds him and cascades around legions of angels who are surrounding the scene. So DeSantis's image on the right of Christ is, is a little sexier. There's this sinuous quality to his body positioning, kind of bordering on feminine. Um, it has this very like exaggerated contrapposto. He is really well built and muscular. There's a little hint of nudity beneath his cascading drapery. Like is, I'm wondering, is this a belly button here? 
is his art is his drapery kind of translucent in a way there's kind of a winking quality to it um his face is this classical italian at handsome with soft curly hair and this beautiful roman nose and this piece is distinctly mannerist in its treatment of bodies as this attenuated or like elongated with these little disproportionate heads and kind of dainty hands and feet so either way, up until the late Middle Ages, depictions of Christ's suffering is near non-existent. Um, but soon the man on the cross begins to be seen as a real man, like beaten, bloody, disfigured by pain, while the portrayal both of the crucifixion and of the various phases of the passion becomes dramatically realistic as it celebrates the humanity of Christ through his suffering. So the image of a suffering Christ was handed down to Renaissance and Baroque culture in a crescendo of this eroticism of suffering, where the insistence on the divine face and body tormented by pain became a play verging on complacency and ambiguity, as is the case with the Christ who doesn't so much bleed as drip with gore in Mel Gibson's movie version of The Passion. In the upper right there, you can see an image of Jim Caviezel in that film as Christ. Um, these horrific images were meant to shock and disgust and most importantly kind of arouse sympathy and sorrow for the man who suffered and died for our sins. Um, St. Augustine wrote in his sermon 27, quote, in order to maintain your faith, Christ deformed himself while he remains eternally beautiful. And we saw him and he possessed neither beauty nor attractiveness. Rather, his face was repellent and his position deformed. This is his power. He was reviled and his position was deformed, a man covered with sores, one who has experienced every weakness. So this concept of Christ's eternal beauty being deformed by suffering renders him even more beautiful by his sacrifice, images of which the penitent and the faithful should meditate on through the medium of art. So art has always been used as not only an attempt at depicting the divine or copying the beauty of nature, but also as a tool so the more cynical among us may see this as an emotionally manipulative effort to convert non-Christians while simultaneously reminding Christians of the suffering of their savior for them. But either way, it's a powerful reminder of how ugliness, deformity, and violence can be used in a religious context to establish both the divinity and the humanity of God in the same, at the same time. So in a lot of ways, this moment of suffering illustrates the moment where Christ's human body is destroyed and he once again ascends to his father's right hand. So in this way, viewing the deformity and violence of Christ's tortured corporeal form is both a call to grief and a celebration of his eventual victory over death. We have a couple of um, Flemish examples here and also uh, the entombment of Christ uh, by Giuseppe Scolari, which is in our uh, exhibition as well. Um, I really love this Boots piece. Um, you know, Christ is, is bruised. You can see this paleness to his skin here on the left. Um, he has dark circles under his eyes. Um, he is both crying and bleeding. It's a very um, emotionally, uh, like kind of really, really emotional image of Christ actively suffering, but suffering in, um, in peace, in a peaceful way, and even raising his hand and blessing. So while Christ in suffering is depicted in a form of sympathetic ugliness like deformity, right? Depictions of the persecutors of Christ soon begin to adopt this ugliness of sin we talked about. So the 19th century philosopher, uh, George Hegel described as such in his aesthetics lectures on fine art, quote, but the enemies are presented to us as inwardly evil because they place themselves in opposition to God, condemn him, mock him, torture him, crucify him, and the idea of inner evil and enmity to God brings with it on the external side, ugliness, crudity, barbarity, rage, and distortion of their outward appearance. Hegel was specifically referring to the North German painters in the Flemish school. There are two examples here. We have Hans Holbein's Christ Mocked and the Arrest of Christ by Hieronymus Bosch. Um, but note how even uh, a delicate artist like Fra Angelico, this uh, image on the lower right, shows us a persecutor who, whose looks are not only coarse, but who vulgarly spits in Jesus's face. So none of this excludes the countless idealized images of Christ as we talked about before, but the introduction of ugliness and suffering to the celebration of the divine encouraged this, these other types of ugliness, which were taken to extreme limits for moralistic and devotional purposes. From images of death, hell, the devil, and sin to those showing sufferings of the martyrs. 
So in the Christian world, uh, sanctity is none other than the imitation of Christ. So suffering, atrocious suffering at that, was the lot of those who gave their lives to bear witness to their faith. And these were the people addressed by Tertullian in his exhortation to martyrdom, um, inviting men and women to bear the unmentionable sufferings, sometimes with kind of ill-concealed sadism, they were doomed to face. So in speaking about the rumored Spartan practice of flagellating male youths as a test of manhood, uh, Tertullian wrote, quote, for it will always be counted even more honorable and glorious should the body perish on account of these sufferings yet give no cry of pain. Therefore, if it is legitimate for love of earthly glory to require a similar test of strength and soul and senses so that they can demonstrate their indifference to the wounds of weapons, the agonies of flames, the torments of the cross, the fury of wild beasts, the refinements of torture, and all for nothing but the mirage of human praise, that I can firmly state that your sufferings are all but trifles when compared with celestial glory and divine reward. So in medieval art, the martyr is seldom shown as deformed by his torment, torments, as some have dared to do with Christ. So while artists emphasize Christ's incomparable immensity of his sacrifice, martyrs are depicted with this kind of angelic serenity with which they went to their respective faiths. Um, and so these depictions of decapitations, roasting on the gridiron, and the removal of breasts can give rise to these graceful compositions, almost kind of ballet-like in form. So like this image uh, from Cornelius Court on the far right in our exhibition, where St. Lawrence kind of ignores his torturers to kind of gracefully plead for the age of, aid of angels above him, um, legend has it that St. Lawrence, who is the patron saint of cooks, said to his torturers shortly before he was roasted to death, turn me over, I'm done on this side, which is a great joke. I mean, regardless of the time period you're in, that's a phenomenal joke. You can't tell me that the Catholics aren't funny. So during and after the Renaissance, in a climate marked by this reevaluation re of the human body and its beauty, there was a tendency to this excessive beautification of some extremely distressing events. Um, so much so that more than torture, which counted what counted was the virile strength or feminine sweetness, which the saints faced in their torment. Um, so this often led to images that were quite often really homoerotic, uh, proof of this being the various representations of the martyrdom of St. Sebastian. Um, there's been a lot of ink spilled about how St. Sebastian, especially in the way that he has been depicted in our history, is representational uh, of a male or homoeroticism and kind of a gay icon and the literal slings and arrows of persecution suffered by gay men throughout history. So Sebastian has often been depicted as emblematic of the pleasure and pain dichotomy within Christian martyrdom. There's also this sense of longing in his gaze, whether this is for his future sanctification, the earthly life that he's leaving behind or both is unclear. But in more recent interpretations, the Christian fixation with the desirable bodies of its saints and the permeable boundaries between the bodily flesh and the divine have been seen as homoerotic or queer. It's this term that we use called queering. So we like queering the medieval, where it's reading the past through a lens that is not um, under the gender binary or the sexual binary. Um, and it opens up to a lot of um, interesting readings of art and literature and all sorts of things. So these Scantily clad paintings of St. Sebastian can be understood as kind of inviting voyeurism to the beautiful male nude. And some have even interpreted Sebastian's persecution as a sort of coming out narrative in which the martyr reveals his true self and is punished for it. Um, there were many very sexy images of St. Sebastian that I could have chose. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of them throughout history. Uh, right here on the left, we have, we have St. Sebastian by Andrea Mantegna from 1490. And then we have this beautiful, sexy St. Sebastian by Giuseppe de Rivera from 1651. Um, <clears throat> but the area where concessions were no longer made to gentility was often the portrayal of the hermit. Um, there aren't any portrayals of hermits specifically in Renaissance impressions, but we certainly have quite a few depictions of what you might call the first hermit, St. Jerome, who spent time in the wilderness living that hermit lifestyle. Uh, there are two here. We have St. Jerome Meditating on a Skull by Battista Franco from the 1530s and St. Jerome in the Wilderness by Giovanni Brito from around the same time. Um, the Hermit, by tradition and definition, uh, was made ugly by these long sojourns in the desert. 
Uh, Baroque spirituality used these models to celebrate the penitence of saints and their disdain for the body, weakened by fasting, flagellation, and other forms of discipline. Um, also among the hermits of the early centuries, the ugliest by far were the stylites. Um, these were individuals who isolated themselves atop of column and they bore the inclemencies of the weather, not to mention the insects and worms that crawled all over them as they struggled with these hauntingly seductive visions or diabolical nightmares. Here we have an image uh, from much later by William Hone from the Everyday Book. This is St. Simon Stylite. Um, and it was an image just to kind of illustrate like, nope, this is a man who <laughs> literally lives on top of a column. So you know what? Life's a rich tapestry. Um, so speaking of St. Jerome, who is most often depicted as an emaciated old man, um, aging specifically has been seen as ugly or malformed in Western culture for generations, and especially for women. It is obvious even in an American culture, right? Actresses frequently lament the fact that after a certain age, regardless of how they look, they're often typecast in mother or grandmother roles, or worse, not considered at all. Uh, many people, regardless of gender, may choose to delay the ravages of time through anti-aging methods, right? Lotions and potions and exercise, clean eating, and of course, plastic surgery. Um, youth is inextricably tied to beauty, virility, and sexuality. I mean, no wonder we're obsessed. Age, on the other hand, is something that's tied to the inevitability of death. We as humans fear death and decay, and aging is an obvious outward sign of the decay of the human body. One might even suggest, as Nietzsche did in his Twilight of the Idols, that, quote, when it comes to beauty, man posits himself as the norm of perfection. He worships himself in this. At bottom, man mirrors himself in things and sees as beautiful all things that reflect his image. Ugliness is seen as a sign and a symptom of degeneration. Every suggestion of exhaustion, heaviness, senility, fatigue, any sort of lack of freedom like convulsions or paralysis, especially the smell, the color, the form of dissolution, of decomposition, all this provokes the identical reaction, the value judgment of ugly. What does man hate? There is no doubt about this. He hates the twilight of his own type. This is like an enormously powerful observation of this knee-jerk disgust that is aroused in people when they encounter the old, the sick, and the disabled. This is something that the disabled community has fought against for eons, right? This right to be seen and treated as a person, no matter how they look or how their bodies act. And this, I would argue, is something that the abled people have to, have to kind of overcome in their own selves. We as humans are repulsed by the uncanny, right? The uncanny meaning this concept of things that are not what they should be. You know, for example, toothlessness is not disturbing in the way that the lips look or the few remaining teeth, but the fact that the few survivors are not accompanied by the others that should be in that mouth. We feel that inconsistency or incompleteness of the whole, and we deem that ugly. And that goes back to aging and that the body is not as fleshy or as nubile as it once was, the face is lined, the eyes are cloudy, the mind is not as sharp. And these are all biological signs of aging and decay. And we as human beings have this biological revulsion to it. So often these aged bodies are used as personifications of things like fury, as you can see here by Jacobo Coraglio, or death, or envy, or any and all representations of negative or terrifying concepts. Aged bodies are frequently depicted near literal skeletons, as you can see here in the allegory of death and fame, furthering this kind of amalgamation of aging and death. Um, this Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse by Albrecht Durer, this is from 1497 and 98, is one of my favorite images of the exhibition, if only because death, this is death, rides a horse. He is this aged, like, old man who is riding an equally aged old horse. And he seems to be the only one who's having a good time in this whole thing. Like he is living, laughing, loving life. Um, everyone else is very focused on what they're doing, you know, trying to stay alive or being trampled by horses or whatever. But he is like having a great time. Um, so, but he is also depicted, death is depicted as an old man. It's like an ancient old man. So I found that to be like so incredibly interesting. So now let's talk about grotesques. Um, these are, uh, the next couple of slides are going to be some images uh, by uh, Etienne Delon. Um, and 
let's talk about the word grotesque. So the word grotesque is defined as a very ugly or comically distorted figure, creature, or image. Um, but used as a noun, especially in this context, um, and in the Renaissance, grotesque was a style of decorative painting or sculpture consisting of this interweaving of human and animal forms with flowers and foliage. Um, there are a handful of grotesques in the Renaissance Impressions exhibition, and we'll talk about just a few of them. Um, but firstly, the history of grotesques is kind of cool. As mentioned previously, Greek art and by extension Roman art was, and one could argue is still today, highly influential on the Western canon. So this weird combination of interlaced foliage and strange creatures was really popular in ancient Rome, especially as fresco wall decoration and floor mosaics. In fact, that's how we got the word grotesque. It comes originally from the Italian grotesca, literally of a cave, um, from the Italian grotta or cave. Um, it's an extravagant style of ancient Roman decorative art rediscovered at Rome at the end of the 15th century, and then it was subsequently imitated. Um, the word was first used of paintings found in the walls of basements of ruins in Rome that were called at the time la grotte or the caves. Uh, these caves were in fact rooms and corridors of the Domus Aurea, the unfinished palace complex started by Nero after the great fire of Rome in 64, which had become overgrown and buried until they were broken into again, mostly from above. So they thought they were caves, but it was actually a, an existing building. So grotesques as a stylistic device in engravings and etchings in the Renaissance were popular because they harkened back to their classical roots, but also because it was a way for an artist to flex some creativity and humor through the lens of ancient art form. Um, though there is this immense variety of figures, uh, the three main tropes of the grotesque are, according to author Remy Ostrup, doubleness, so this like mirroring of either side, uh, hybridity, or this combination of like animals and humans or animals and animal, animals, and metamorphosis, where you're seeing this this change of a figure into another thing. And this is where I would argue beauty and ugliness really coalesce in a really interesting way. These images are whimsical and decorative and they're purposeless, right? They're meant as ornaments for enjoyment, little more. And you can argue the fact that a good amount of these characters designed by Delon are ugly. There's even an aspect of gross humor in the grotesque with Venus, where these little farting satyrs at the bottom um, but there is this beauty and an elegance to these hybrid metamorphizing characters as well. There's that, you can see the detail above, these strange bird-human hybrid in the grotesque with Apollo is really monstrous looking, but its lower half tapers to this elegant point that rests on the center of the volume below. Um, same with the uh, partial demon uh, of the grotesque with Mercury, whose body curves and diminishes into this decorative arabesque or the weird horse elephant curly tailed thing above it, whose aforementioned tail winds around this sprig of vine. So this hybridization of beauty and strangeness is also evidenced by the beautiful female figures in grotesque with Diana on the left, um, whose beautiful bodies descend into a corkscrew whirlwind that terminates in the petals of a flower. So one can make the argument that the grotesque is not just a fun decoration and a way for an artist to show off his creative skill, but also a universal device that societies have used to conceptualize a sense of otherness and also societal change. So the Renaissance was a time of great upheaval in almost every aspect of civilization, science, art, politics, and an understanding of the wider world and an individual's place in it. So these grotesques were a small way in which people could explore this aspect of the ugliness of the unknown in a safe and arguably beautiful way. So finally, in closing, I'm going to talk a little bit about like the ugliness, safe ugliness, and, and also the concept of the sublime and its, con and its connection to horror. So right now we use, nowadays we use the term sublime to talk about a particularly delicious meal or a piece of cake, right? or even possibly an experience like going to the opera or seeing a really good movie, for example. In that way, we're using the term sublime to mean incredibly excellent to the point of ascendance to a higher plane, right? But the aesthetic concept of the sublime is the arousal of passions through the comprehension of awe-inspiring or terrible things. Essentially, it is the appreciation of beauty through the lens of horror or fear. I'm being a little reductive in that definition, but it serves our purposes for this talk at least. So in Britain, the development of the concept of the sublime uh, as an aesthetic quality in nature distinct from beauty 
was brought into prominence in the 18th century in the writings of Anthony Ashley Cooper, who's the third Earl of Shaftesbury, and author John Dennis. So these authors expressed an appreciation of the fearful and irregular forms of external nature. And Joseph Addison, another author, did a synthesis of concepts of the sublime in his The Spectator and later The Pleasures of the Imagination. So all three of these Englishmen had within the span of several years made the journey across the Alps and commented in their writings of the horrors and harmony of the experience, expressing this contrast of aesthetic qualities. Um, John Dennis, in his account of crossing the Alps in Miscellanies in 1693, the experience of the journey was at once a pleasure to the eye as music is to the ear, but mingled with horrors and sometimes almost with despair. So nature in its most destructive form, right? Storms, weather, fire, et cetera, can be both overwhelmingly terrifying and also beautiful in its most primal form. The philosopher Edmund Burke developed his conception of sublimity in a philosophy, philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful of 1756. Burke was the first philosopher to argue that sublimity and beauty are mutually exclusive. The dichotomy that Burke articulated is antithetical to the same degree as light and darkness. You know, light may accentuate beauty, but either great light or darkness, i.e. the absence of light, right, is sublime to the extent that it can annihilate vision of the object in question. So what is dark, uncertain, and confused moves the imagination to awe and a degree of horror. So while the relationship of sublimity and beauty is one of mutual exclusivity, either can provide pleasure. So sublimity may evoke horror, but knowledge that the perception is a fiction is pleasurable. And this is why there was a big trend in Gothic literature during the Romantic era, and why a lot of people love horror movies today. You might ask yourself, like, how can being terrified be a good thing, be pleasant? The answer is when it does not press too closely upon us, as Edmund Burke wrote. So this implies a detachment from the cause of fear, and therefore there is a certain kind of indifference to it. Pain and terror are causes of the sublime, as long as they are not really harmful. So this indifference is the same attitude that in previous centuries was closely associated with the idea of beauty. Beauty is that which produces a pleasure that does not necessarily create a desire to possess or consume the thing that pleases. Likewise, horror bound up with the sublime is the horror of something that cannot possess us and cannot harm us. So in this lies the deep relationship between beauty and the sublime. And I think this kind of boils down to why I really love ugliness or horror or grotesque or the uncanny or, or whatever in art as a whole. Beauty can sometimes be boring. There's only so many depictions of beautiful women or lovely sun dappled landscapes that you can take in. But an element of ugliness in capital A art, I feel really emphasizes both the limitations and infiniteness of humanity. There are so many different kinds of ugliness that we can describe, and I did, but we can describe them as amazing or terrible or funny or just like cool, that's a cool image, you know? You may not find these elements beautiful per se, but they make an impact all the same that potentially something that was just straightforwardly beautiful wouldn't. I tell my students all the time that art is a tool and can be used for all sorts of things, you know, propaganda, decoration, veneration, manipulation, all throughout history. And the ingredient of ugliness is that in the tool of art just further serves to sharpen that tool in the way that beauty may not. Um, I'm actually planning on doing an exhibition of ugliness specifically at the MAG uh, next year um, using our permanent collection. So hopefully you'll be able to come to see that. I am like crazy about ugliness, weirdly enough, as an art historian. Um, but that is my talk. I hope that you all enjoyed it. Um, and I guess, does anybody have any questions for me? Lauren, thank you so much for your talk. That Thanks. was incredible. I really appreciate your enthusiasm um, for ugliness and yeah. having you just walk us through all of the horrific and strange creatures and just inventions that artists were coming up with at the time. Yeah, um, we yeah. do it's have incredible. some questions coming in from the audience. Um, okay, so here's your first question. Is there a specific or identifiable line between beautiful and ugly as it pertains to the usefulness you discussed near the beginning? And 
are these things not useful because they are art or are they useful as art and therefore beautiful even though they are grotesque? It's a good question. Uh, yes, yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> so um, it is interesting, like this line between beautiful and ugly. And um, by the way, I definitely, not because I, I'm not getting paid, but I got a lot of this from On Ugliness by Umberto Eco, um, which is a great, it's like a seminal text. It's wonderful. One of my favorite, favorite art historical texts. So um, the line between beautiful and ugly is different for many different people and also different for um, different cultures too, right? Like there is, a, there's this whole concept of like, Colonialist people, colonialist people like moving into an area and being like, these people are hideous, but it's just because they're different, right? There's this concept of differentness as being like repellent. Um, so these, I would, I would argue as an art historian, like all art is useful. All art is useful in that it helps to expand your knowledge of the wider world. And sometimes ugliness can um, shock you into paying attention to it the way that beauty may not, right? We all like assume that art is going to be beautiful because it's in a museum, like it's hanging on a wall. Why wouldn't it be beautiful? So when ugliness is, is apparent or there is an artwork that is really challenging um, and it creates a visceral reaction inside of you, I think that whatever message that artwork is trying to convey um, makes it that much sharper and that much more, um, uh, much, it gives it much more light to it, right? Like you're paying more attention to it. I hope that answers your question. I'm not entirely sure. Well, I think that's a great, I think that's a great answer. Thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. um, another question for you from the audience. Um, in the Four Horsemen, the central figure is not skeletal like the other three figures. Why is that? The central figure is not skeletal. Oh yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think it's that it's because he is kind of barrel chested and he looks very, um, he also has like a pair of scales as well. Um, I, I think that it's because it's to evoke like power. Like he is a powerful individual who is going to trample you to death with his, with his, you know, horse and his, and his like balance thing. I don't know why I can't think of the word for it, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's supposed to imply, um, like, a he's a central figure as well. So he has this, there's a, a, a level of like power that's implied in his kind of body figuring. Um, kind of, I, I feel like this is maybe a little bit similar, but another question for you. Um, are there any themes or motifs or imagery that you're surprised are not as common from the time period that many of these prints were made? Images that I'm surprised. Uh, I think um, there's not a lot of images of women that aren't saints. Um, or the Virgin Mary, um, or or personifications of hideousness. <laughs> so it's a lot of. I mean, again, you know, like it's a we're, we live in like a patriarchal society, and it was a patriarchal society in the Renaissance, and all of that stuff. So women are either you know Madonnas, like these saints that are like being you know taken up to heaven, or they're harpies who are going to you know better watch out for them because they're going to destroy you, kind of thing. <laughs> so it's it's this again this like binary right ugliness and beauty there's this binary of like women are either saintly or horrible and you don't get a middle <laughs> um but that's something that you could talk about with art history just in general for you know thousands of years um but for sure yeah i think images of women um and uh but i mean there's a lot of strangeness in this renaissance impression show there's a lot of weird images that you that I don't have a lot of explanation where it's like, we don't know why they made this thing. Like that image of fury, like it's supposed to be a personification of fury, I guess, but why? Like, why Why did you decide to put in the effort of making an image of someone who is furious um, and also is nude and hideous and being, you know, beset by monsters? Like these kinds of things, these kind of questions and stuff is interesting to kind of, you know, read as you're walking through the exhibition for sure. Thank you, Lauren. This is yeah. a question you will love, I uh -huh. think, I hope. Um, are there any contemporary artists besides George Kondo who are focusing on the grotesque or ugly as their main themes or styles? That is an excellent question. And you know what? I'm so glad you asked it because I was just re reading an article um, in New York Magazine about John Curran, 
So <laughs> John Curran has been working for a very long time and he makes these, and he just, he has a gallery right now at Gavosian. I mean, he's got a show right now at the Gavosian Gallery and he's doing these Renaissance-esque images of women, but they're like gross. There's like, they have like these giant breasts and they're twisted into weird body shapes. It's Curran, C-U-R-R-I-N, John Curran. Um, and he norm he's a he's a fantastically talented painter. Like his technique is, I mean, he's classically trained, but his figures are so they have long necks. They're weirdly disproportional. They're usually like laughing or screaming or drooling or doing something, and it's it's actually like really repellent. And that has been his whole steez his entire career is this like attenuated, long, gross like with hand gestures that are really bony and, and it's just incredible. Like it's both awful and amazing. And uh, people who are fans of John Curran have like a screw loose, but I can totally appreciate it. It's very weird. Definitely John Curran, I would say. Oh man, I can't wait to look up his work. Um, yeah. I also love creepy, strange mm -hmm. art. Like you said, I think I think you make a great point that it makes it more interesting to look at and then catches your attention versus the typical beautiful beauty yeah. that we see so often in art. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's like that concept of the uncanny, right? Where you're looking at something, you're like, this does not sit well with me. I do not like it. And I don't know why. Like, I don't know why this is really like throwing me off. It's giving me a bad feeling. My mother always says that oh, it disturbs my spirit. She always taps her chest and says, oh, it disturbs my spirit. And it's just that concept of like being disturbed, like, like I'm disturbed and I don't know why. And I don't want to look at it, but I keep, I have to keep looking at it because I can't figure out why I hate it so much. And I, I mean, you know, when I'm like, when we're looking at new acquisitions or like, we're looking at stuff and I always go, oh, I hate it. Like, I can't wait to, <laughs> like, it's just, it's this weird, like moment where you're like, I hate this so much. I would never hang it in my house but I love it because it's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And that kind of like feeling that you get or, or, you know, the feeling where you're like, I can't even look at that. That's horrendous. Is really what got me to like, think about this as an exhibition and think about this as a talk. Like, why, like, why, why do we get that feeling from art? I mean, it can't hurt you, you know, you don't have to look at it, but it, it still gives you that feeling regardless and has for eons. So that's kind of my bad. <laughs> Last question for you. It's pretty obvious that you love the ugly in art. Mm -hmm. um, do you have either a favorite artist or a favorite creature that is featured in this exhibition? Ooh, well, first of all, trying to pick my favorite artist is like trying to pick my favorite child. But <laughs> um, not that I have any children, but uh, I think um, I really love. Uh, Albert Durer's work. Um, it's just so like crisp and beautiful and there's this wonderful sense of movement in it. Um, Albert Durer is probably my favorite in the exhibition, um, which is funny because the, the two images that we have are, are actually like unequivocally beautiful. Like they're not especially <laughs> disgusting or any of those things. Um, but yeah, Durer pieces are so just gorgeous and they just fill the space, just wonderfully crisp lines and like just really well modeled and, and observed. He's a great artist. Mm -hmm. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for your lecture tonight. Um, we are out of questions. Thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us today and for supporting MAG with your membership. We do have member hours tonight from 5 to 9 p.m. to see our new exhibition, Renaissance Impressions. Tickets are required to come visit for those hours. Um, so that we don't exceed capacity in our gallery spaces. Um, but we do have tickets still available. I'm going to send a link in the chat. There's a link to reserve tickets for tonight if you haven't had a chance to do so yet. I'll also highlight our public opening lecture is tomorrow, also online, that's Sunday, November 14th. It'll be at 2 p.m. and members are welcome to sign up for that. It'll be Bernard Barate, an expert on the print collection and author of our exhibitions catalog. He'll be discussing printmaking techniques and how the prints were marketed and prized by collectors. 
He'll also be discussing mannerism, which is the imaginative style of art that was dominant in Europe during the 1500s and all the ways that these images can be interpreted. Um, I'm gonna send a link to the public lecture as well. I think it'll be really interesting. Um, so thank you all again for joining us today and for supporting the MAG. We'll be sharing a recording of today's webinar later this week. Thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you at the MAG soon. Bye.